Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. If you need to pause it to reread the problem, feel free to do so. This question depends on the concept of magnetic flux, or even more specifically, the change in magnetic flux. So let's take a look at the equation that governs magnetic flux. So we use this funny Greek letter, and then we say that the magnetic flux is equal to the magnetic field strength multiplied by the area of your loop multiplied by a cosine of a particular angle. So why don't we talk about that angle right now? Let's draw the loop from a slightly different perspective. Let's draw it sort of edge on like this. And let's call this side of the loop sort of into the page. And the other side would be out of the page. Now the question indicates in the text, but also in the picture, that the magnetic field vectors are pointing into the page. You can see those green crosses. Crosses indicate a vector directed into the page. So our magnetic field would be pointing in this direction, into the page. But we also have a, another vector, and it's called the normal vector. Basically, the normal vector is an imaginary vector that goes right through the center of the loop and it's perpendicular to the plane of the loop. So this angle right here would be a 90 degree angle. So the green vector is the magnetic field and the purple vector is the normal vector. And again, the normal vector is just an imaginary vector that we draw perpendicular to the plane of the loop. Now ask yourself, what is the angle between those two vectors? And hopefully you would see that the angle is zero degrees. So in this question, our angle is going to be zero degrees. And you may know that the cosine of zero degrees is equal to one. So in this particular question, we can ignore that term because we're going to have b times a times one, which is just b times a. So we can get rid of that for the sake of this problem here. But now let's look at the initial flux more carefully. So we're going to actually break this down a little bit more in detail. We're going to call this the initial flux. So we'll put a little i for initial there. And that's going to equal the initial magnetic field and then multiplied by the initial area. Now, the initial magnetic field is given in the question. It's 25 millitesla. Now, because it's millitesla, we're going to have to take the 25 and multiply by 10 to the minus 3. That gets it into the standard unit of Tesla. And then the area of this circular loop is just going to be the area of a circle. So the area of a circle is pi multiplied by the initial radius squared. Now, the initial diameter is given, that's two centimeters, so that means that the initial radius would be half of that. It would be one centimeter, but we would have to divide by 100 to get it into meters. So, again, our initial radius, once we divide one by 100, is going to be 0 0.01 meters, and then it's pi times radius squared for the area of a circle. So this is going to be the calculation giving us the initial magnetic flux. Let's go ahead and calculate it. And when you do that, you would see that the initial magnetic flux is going to equal roughly 7.85 times 10 to the minus 6. As far as the unit is concerned, you can either do Tesla times a meter squared, since those are the units we put into the calculation, but a Tesla times a meter squared is also known as a Weber. So you can actually more simply just call this a Weber. There's your initial flux, magnetic flux. But the question notes that the wire is quickly pulled taut and the circular kink shrinks to a diameter of zero. Well, if the diameter is zero, then the radius is also zero. And knowing that the radius is going to zero allows us to calculate the final magnetic flux. So we take the final magnetic field, multiply it by the final area. But think about that for a moment. If the radius, the final radius is zero, then the final area would be zero. And if we multiply the magnetic field by zero, we get zero. So the magnetic flux final is going to equal zero Webers. Good. So we have the initial magnetic flux and we have the final magnetic flux, but we want to know what the average voltage induced during this process is, the average induced voltage. Now, Faraday told us that the induced voltage is going to equal the negative of the change in the magnetic flux, notice it's a change in magnetic flux, divided by a change in time. Now we know the change in time for part A because it was given, it was 50 milliseconds. So for the change in time in the denominator, it's gonna be 50 milliseconds. So that would be 50 times 10 to the minus three seconds. For the change in flux, we're gonna take the final flux, which was zero Webers, and subtract the initial flux, which was calculated earlier, and this is how we're going to find 
the induced voltage during this process. Now, if we compute this very carefully, of course, we're going to get around 1.57 times 10 to the minus 4. And because this is an induced voltage, this would be in volts. So this would be the correct answer, but your homework might require a conversion to millivolts. So we'll do a quick conversion. Hopefully we know that one millivolt is 10 to the minus three. That's supposed to be a three volts. So when you compute that, you would get 1.57 millivolts. So that would be the correct answer to part A. But there actually was another thing being asked in part A. And that was something about the polarity. Yeah, right here. It says include the polarity. So let's take a careful look at that. But actually, before that, I realized that I made a calculational blunder here. Forgive me, please. But that actually should come out into 0.157 millivolts. Probably somebody noticed that. So forgive me for that. But there is the correction to the value of the induced voltage. But now we're going to move to the polarity. So here's the original picture. Keep in mind, again, that the loop is shrinking until the area is zero. So keeping that thought in mind, we want to make a couple of notes. First of all, the magnetic field, again, is going into the page. That's the magnetic field applied to this circular loop. Now, because the loop is decreasing in area, this means that the flux is decreasing. The flux is decreasing. We saw that earlier. It went from some non-zero value to zero. So the flux is decreasing. But notice that it's decreasing into the page. Now, Lenz's law tells us that if there is a flux decreasing into the page, then we need an induced magnetic field, an induced magnetic field that is going to go into the page. So think of this as opposing what the flux is doing. The flux is decreasing into the page. The induced field has to increase into the page to kind of offset it. That's, in a nutshell, Lenz's law. So we need an induced magnetic field into the page. So let's take a look again at that loop. So here's the loop. And what we need to do now that we know there's an induced field going into the page is we need to use a right-hand rule. So you want to imagine that you're grabbing the loop with your right hand and you want to make sure that your fingers are directed into the page. Now, I'm never very good at drawing this, so bear with me. These are my four fingers. They're curling their way into the page as I grasp the wire. Now, as I grasp the wire, my thumb would be naturally pointing in that direction right there. So you can see, hopefully, that my thumb is pointing in that direction. That's actually going to give me the direction of the induced current. So the induced current is going clockwise. Now, if that's the case, if we have a current that's going clockwise, then we have positive charges. We do envision that current is made of positive charges, even though it's technically made of negative charges. <laughs> that's a long story. But we have these positive charges going clockwise. Now, once they go clockwise, they're going to actually start moving in this direction. So just imagine a little train of positive charges moving this way. And they're going to accumulate at point B. So point B is going to develop a positive charge because all of the charges that are accumulating there, point A would actually accumulate negative charge. But when it comes to the polarity question, we can say that point B, point B is positive relative to point A. And that's probably off the screen, so let me drag that in. So that would be the correct answer for the second part of part A, that point B is positive relative to point A. So we're going to do this kind of thought experiment all over again. We do have a part B, so let's take a look at that. Now, in part B, it says that the kink is undisturbed, so this time the area won't change, but the magnetic field is increasing to 100 millitesla. Recall that the initial magnetic field was the 25 millitesla, so that's 25 times 10 to the minus 3 tesla, but now we have a final magnetic field that is larger. It's 100 times 10 to the minus 3 tesla. So that means that the flux is this time increasing because the field is increasing. So let's find out how much the flux is actually increasing. And to do that, we're going to need the initial and the final flux. So let's go back to the initial flux. We know that that's going to be the initial magnetic field 
which we just wrote down. So that's the 25 times 10 to the minus 3 Tesla. That's your initial magnetic field. And then that's going to be times the initial area. Well, that would be pi times the radius, which was the, what was that? That was 1 centimeter, so 0 0.01 meters and that'll be squared so we'll compute that in just a moment but let's go ahead and set up the final magnetic flux so we take the final magnetic field like that and then we multiply by the final area now remember the kink was left undisturbed so the radius is still going to be that 0.01 meters squared so let's take out our calculators and process these so there we have it the final and initial flux so then Faraday's law tells us there's an induced voltage. That's going to be the negative of the change in the magnetic flux. Again, notice that it's a change divided by the change in time. This time, the change in time was different. It was 4 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. So keep that in mind. So we're going to do negative, and then the final magnetic flux we have written down. Remember, when you do a change, it's always the final minus the initial. And then the initial we had computed as well. And then we're going to divide that by the new time interval, which was that 4 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. So when you crunch that down, you should get 0 0.00589. This would be in volts. We'll do a quick conversion again. 1 millivolt is 10 to the minus 3 volts. So when you do that conversion, you should get around 5.89 millivolts. Now, some of you might have noticed that when you do the calculation, it actually comes out to be negative. But I think when you report this in your homework system, you want to just actually report it as a positive. And we're going to talk about that negative in just a moment. The negative is built into the equation to remind us of Lenz's law. Lenz's law is coming up in just a second. So this would be the correct answer for the magnitude of the voltage, 5.89 millivolts. But now we look at Lenz's law. We look at that negative. Lenz's law is all about what happens to the induced magnetic field. Remember, the negative reminds us that the induced field should oppose the applied field. You want to say that a hundred times to understand that, that the induced field will oppose the applied field. Now let's look at the applied field. The applied field is going into the page. The applied field is going into the page. But it was increasing. Remember, it went from 25 milli Tesla into a 100 milli Tesla. So we want to take some notes here. We want to say that the applied magnetic field is into the page and it's increasing. The applied magnetic field is increasing. Lenz's law tells us that the induced field must oppose that change. It must oppose that change. So since the applied field is increasing into the page, we need the induced field to come out of the page. We need it to come out of the page. So you're going to have to suffer through one of my other right-hand rule drawings. Here's the loop. We want to grab the loop with our right hand, but this time we want our four fingers to sort of curl out of the page. Let me see if I can draw that. That will probably be the best that I could ever do right there, I'm sorry to say. But the four fingers are curling out of the page. They're kind of curling in that direction there. And the key is where the thumb is pointing. This time the thumb is pointing in a counterclockwise direction. So now all these positive charges are moving in a counterclockwise direction. So let's look at our picture here. Counterclockwise would mean that the charges are moving like this. Remember, the charges are assumed to be positive. So these positive charges move counterclockwise. And as they do that, they're actually now going to accumulate on the other side of the wire. So in this case, point A is going to be positive relative to point B. That's going to be the polarity. So point A is positive relative to point B. That's going to be the correct answer for the second part of part B.